All right. So, the COVID-19 pandemic shifted much of our everyday lives online. But even Imagine before the pandemic... All right. Once again, I would like to request everyone to mute the microphones if it's not needed. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll go back. The COVID-19 pandemic shifted much of our everyday lives online. But even before the pandemic, online and mobile banking were the most popular ways to bank already. Now that it has become essential to have online wallets, some are still hesitant to utilize these features. The usual reasons are, first, they are not sure if online banks are as secure as the traditional banks, or may still be a little too new or untested. And the most common would be it might be difficult to navigate as it is too technical. Today, we have invited a knowledgeable person to address our concerns and break the mindset that online banking is some sort of a sort of software that would get all of our money. Instead, it will make our lives easier by making banking activities convenient as it is both energy saving and time saving. How will digital banking help us be safe from the typhoon and the Delta variant, right? So, good day everyone. My name is Aldrin Antonio and I will be your host for today's learning session. As part of the whole year-round series of webinars, I formally welcome you to the seventh webinar entitled Digital Banking Awareness, a Thread to Traditional Banking Practices. In the next two hours of this learning session, we are expected to know and understand the concept of financial technology, its importance in various industries, and its benefits to their clientele. Identify the different types of financial technology companies, its categories based on their industry and the clients they belong to. Deepen the clientele's awareness of the importance of fintech its tangible threat to our daily lives, and the possible risks that may be properly managed. Enumerate the major advantages of fintech to our economic success. Distinguish the effect of fintech on the data privacy, data security, and privacy protection. And be guided in the development of our own systems and services, whether in-house or in coordination with fintech offices, to come up with our own system. All right, so before we do have the um, welcome remarks, I would like to acknowledge the presence of our president, Attorney Danny Chan. Good afternoon, Attorney. Good afternoon, and okay. So, to formally start our program, let us welcome Dr. Imelda Sineri, the head of the Office for Continuing Professional Education, to give us the welcome remarks. Dr. Neri, you are muted. Dr. Neri, we cannot hear you. Okay, now. All right. All right. Uh, again, thank you very much, Professor Aldrin Antonio. A pleasant, although very rainy, joyful Saturday, everyone. On behalf of the Chiang Kai she College administrators, led, of course, by the very energetic attorney, Danny Chan. Our Vice Presidents, Professor Judelio Yap, Dr. Roland Chua, Dr. Steve Wong, and the only rose among the thorns, the very hands-on Dean Maribel Chan. I would like to welcome each and every one of you in this seventh webinar. So a uh, special welcome goes to those who are attending this webinar for the first time, taking into consideration the idea that Chiang Kai-shek College really stands for, of course, other than the name of the school, the strong commitment, C, K, to spread information, press ideas and knowledge, K, S, in a very systematic manner, for all the stakeholders to be very competitive. This afternoon's seminar with the theme, the height of FinTech, banking awareness, is it really a threat to the banking traditional practices? Well, this afternoon answers will also be very, very clear 
together with the idea that our sizable amount of money in the bank will never be compromised because we have invited a real, real, well sought after speaker and will answer all our queries in terms of so many ideas that would make smart cities in business as well as in cropped currency, blockchains, and other digital currency. So without too much ado, welcome to this webinar. Sit back, relax, and a pleasant afternoon to everyone. Good day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Neri. Now let us move forward by meeting our resource person. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Brace yourselves as you listen to the outstanding and remarkable credentials of our resource speaker. Our speaker for today has an extensive background in international business in the Asia Pacific, both as a professional in the financial industry, as well as being successful entrepreneur. He is the president and CEO of OmniPay Incorporated, the Philippines' leading issuer of prepaid payment cards and innovator for financial inclusion. He is likewise the commissioner of PT OmniPay Indonesia, chairman of OmniPay Malaysia, Sendirian Berhad, and director of OmniPay Private Limited. He is also the vice chairman of Bastion Payment Systems Corporation, which is delivering the new real-time cross-settlement system to the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. He is also an independent director and chairman of the Corporate Governance Committee of Maybank Philippines Incorporated. He is also a director of the publicly listed Trans-Pacific Broadband Group International Incorporated. He is also serving as a director and treasurer of the E-Money Association of the Philippines. He served as an advisor of the Supreme Court of the Philippines. He was also a consultant to the Commission on Elections and to the Official of International Policy and Special Concerns of Department of National Defense. He was an independent director on the Board of Federal Resources Investment Group Incorporated and former director of the Philippine Payments Management Incorporated. His past experiences include advisor organization, advisor origination of Hambrick and Quest Philippines Incorporated, and president of Four Star Consulting. He was a service provider to RBS Couts Bank Limited. As per his academics, he has a Master of Business Administration degree from the Ivy School of Business of the University of Western Ontario and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Psychology and Economics from the University of British Columbia. He received additional training with a second advanced program for central bankers and regulators at the Institute of Global Economics and Finance of the Chinese University of Hong Kong an executive education course in uh, creating shared value from Harvard Business School. Futures Thinking Online Program from the School of Executive Education and Lifelong Learning of the Asian Institute of Management and Bank Governance Program from the Side Business School of the University of Oxford. Our research speaker is deeply involved in ministry work. He is an elder and presider at Grace Christian Church of the Philippines. He is the president and CEO of Trustee of Wycliffe Associates Incorporated, based in Orlando, Florida. He is also the board advisor and past chairman of Wycliffe Bible Translators Philippines Incorporated. He is likewise the chairman of the board of trustees of the Biblical Seminary of the Philippines. He is the Vice Chairman of the Board of Trustees and Chairman of the Audit Committee of World Vision Development Foundation Incorporated, better known as World Vision Philippines. He is also a corporate member of the Far Eastern Broadcasting Corporation Philippines. All right, we are not done yet. Our speaker today also maintains extensive ties within the broader community. He is the chairman of the Security Disaster Resource Group Committee of the American Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines. He is also the past chairman of the Overseas Security Advisory Council, Manila Country Chapter. 
a federal advisory committee with U.S. government charter to promote security cooperation between the U.S. Department of State and American business and private sector interests worldwide. He holds the rank of commander in the Philippine Coast Guard Auxiliary and is Deputy Comptroller National Headquarters. He is currently a consultant to the National Bureau of, Bureau of Investigation. He is also a member of the Management Association of the Philippines, the Financial Executives of the Philippines and the Makati Business Club. He has had in numerous speaking engagements, including resource speaker for U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation on advanced money laundering using electronic payment systems. Keynote speaker to Computer World Conference on Cloud Computing Security. Speaker at the National Defense College of the Philippines on IT Security Management and speaker at various financial inclusion conferences locally and internationally. He also contributed an article on the evolving landscape on information security in a special edition of the National Security Review in 2012, published by the National Defense College of the Philippines. He was honored with Outstanding Alumni Award in 2015 by Grace Christian College. He also won ACQ 2016 Global Awards Philippines Game Changer of the Year and ACQ 2018 Global Awards International Game Changer of the Year, FinTech. Now, without further ado, join me in welcoming our speaker for today, Mr. Simon Ong. Thank you very much for the very generous introduction, Aldrin. I do want to uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak with each of you. Um, I'll try to leave a lot of time at the end for questions because I'm sure there's going to be a fair bit as the topic is very broad and I won't be able to cover everything in great detail. I do want to reassure you, Dr. Neri, that uh, you have two alumni who work very closely with me uh, in this session today. Uh, Carlos Tenkiat is my partner in, in our companies, and also Samuel Tan. He's our, he, we also work very closely with him from Union Pay International. They're both proud Chiang Kai-shek graduates. Uh, let me just share my screen. and then we'll get started. Can everyone see my screen now? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Opo. Uh, Professor Aldrin, if you can, I'll depend on you to monitor the chat box and then uh, field the questions for later. Sure, I don't think I'll be able to keep up with it. <laughs> so today we're speaking about fintech and we're speaking about banking. So this is the basic agenda I've prepared for this afternoon. Just a quick background and then an introduction to the industry. Then we'll talk about the future of fintech and the adaptation of fintech and some potential applications perhaps and some takeaway points. I will be going rather quickly through these slides because um, I think it will be of better and greater benefit to everyone for the open forum sessions where you can ask your questions. As uh, Dr. Neri had, and Dr., uh, Professor Aldrin had stated, I am a Filipino Chinese, although I grew up in Canada, I believe uh, Dr. Neri probably asked me to speak to you today on FinTech, especially uh, be because of our unique background. OmniPay is the leading provider of prepaid cards in the Philippines. It's basically the front end to our back end system, Bastion payment systems. 
most of you probably won't know Bastion, but uh, we have the distinction of providing the foundational payment system for the country to the central bank. So this is called the RTGS or real-time growth settlement system. This is the system that the Banco Central operates where all the banks plug into, the Department of Finance, Bureau of Internal Revenue, uh, the Philippine Stock Exchange, BankNet, the Philippine Clearinghouse. Let's just say it's a critical infrastructure for clearing payments for the country. And so this is something that is uh, that was delivered to the central bank just this week uh, for their soft launch. And we're just waiting for the central bank to announce the actual public launch. I am very grateful to my partner and fo fellow founder, Carlos Tenkiat, who is a proud Chiang Kai-shek alumni who is with us today. Philippine E-Money Association may not be also known to very many people. The, it's, a mem it's a, an association that the central bank asked us to form, basically composed of non-banks, electronic money issuers. So our founding members include uh, PayMaya, GCash, OmniPay, and we were recently joined by GrabPay as well. Uh, Maybank is a regional bank right, with, with presence in all of, all of the ASEAN countries. It's probably ranked in the top three or top four right now in terms of assets in the region. These are some of the sample programs we do as OmniPay. Most of you would not have heard of the company, but you probably know our clients. So on the far left, you have the Philippine Airlines with the Mabuhay Miles Travel Card, World Vision, and then uh, one of our newest innovations back in 2012, in before the national ID was uh, enacted, where we did a citizen's ID for the local government units. So brief history of FinTech really started from the cards, from the credit cards. So in 1950, Diners Club was founded as a charge card. I don't think any of us were born yet at the time. Uh, 1951, JCB in Japan as a credit bureau, American Express in 58 was established actually to compete with the United States Postal Service money order product. In 1966, Bank AmeriCard expanded nationally to become Visa, as did Interbank Card Association and Master, now known as MasterCard. In 2002, China Union Pay found, was founded in China as a domestic ATM network and later on expanded internationally. The country manager of Union Pay International in the Philippines is also a Chiang Kai-shek alumni. He's also with us today, Samuel Tan. Uh, next came the e-wallets in 1999. PayPal was launched as a payment system for eBay. In 2004, Alipay was established as an escrow system for Alibaba. And in 2013, WeChat Pay was founded to facilitate the transfer of funds within a social network. So that gives you a little bit of background and history to set the foundation for FinTech. So a brief introduction for this dynamic and borderless industry. Very, very exciting, very, very dynamic and fast changing. One thing to note here is that the change in the industry is accelerating. If you consider that the landlines or telephones took 50 year, 75 years to reach 50 million users. Credit cards took 28 years. YouTube took 10 months. Pokemon Go took 19 days. This gives you an idea of the scale of acceleration of change. So this is a very dynamic industry. In fact, and Aldrin will tell you, I couldn't send up the PowerPoint very early because it keeps changing so quickly, I rev I, it gets updated day by day. This very busy slide gives you an idea of how confusing fintechs can be. I've broadly categorized some of the more popular brands from payments to personal finance, to retail investments, to banking infrastructure, crowdfunding and the like. But I think for our purposes today, we probably need to take a step back 
and take a look at the bigger picture. What are the functions of FinTech? So here I tried to classify FinTech in terms of its core function, whether it's to transfer or store value in, sp in space, this is normally referred to as payments, transfer or store value in time, this is lending or investments, and managing the entropy in value by insurance. We'll spend most of our time in payments today because that's the most well-developed aspect of FinTech at this point in time. From the industry's perspective, we look at FinTech as having three waves. We're on the third wave now, not the COVID surge that we're all familiar with, unfortunately, but uh, in terms of the waves of FinTech in, in terms of the types of innovations that we were seeing and the types of activities we were seeing in the industry. So FinTech really started post 2008 financial crisis where there were a lot of techni technology enabled startup that tried to seize opportunities in the market. And the big players are taking notice that the fintechs wanted to disrupt the banks. Currently, I think the industry has evolved to a, to a point where partnerships are trying to be built using the scale of the incumbent banks and taking advantage of the agility of the startups. You should note that from a bank's perspective, it's they tend to be very risk averse because you can't afford mistakes. And so it's actually very difficult for any startup to work with banks because of the bureaucracy, checks and balance, and of course the regulatory burden that are put on banks. So now you have this dynamic tension between banks and fintechs. Now, of course, this is a caricature on the left where it talks about banks being concerned about cannibalizing their existing range of obsolete products that nobody wants to the other side where the fintechs think it, having a big part bank partnership is a sure way to run out of this uh, run out of money it is difficult uh, because we've seen both sides of the of the of the equation to have collaboration in a meaningful way between banks and fintechs both have to change the way they do their own business. Both have to adjust to the different culture. Most fintechs won't have the staying power, financial resources, or bandwidth even to deal with the bank bureaucracies. And the banks also have to deal a lot in terms of risk, regulatory risk of dealing with a fintech to third party vendor risk. What if the fintech is no longer around in two years and their system is still running? So from the bank's perspective, it's also difficult to work with a small fintech. So this is our fearless forecast. We'll, we try to break it up into trends of fintech that we are observing in the marketplace today. And then what we forecast or what we're expecting to see in the near future. The trends in fintech, the first trend that we're watching is biometrics biometrics, not just for payments, but also for identification or authentication. A lot of you may have used your mobile phones in terms of your facial recognition, or maybe your fingerprint to be to be able to authenticate. So it's a very similar concept. Um, I don't think we've have any uh, deployments yet here in the country. We've seen this in China, of course, with facial biometrics. In Japan, they were experimenting with palm biometrics where instead of tapping your card, you put your hand over the point of sale device. So this is something we're watching uh, closely, although frankly, I don't see, a, I don't see this being ve very relevant to the Philippines in the near future in terms of pure payments, maybe more for the authentication of identification. The second trend we're watching are the national switches. So locally here, we have BankNet, where all the banks and e-money issuers are plugged into. Abroad, you have NPCI, you have UnionPay, PayNet in Malaysia, GPN in Indonesia. Now, what we're watching here isn't so much that, the, that these national switches are growing in terms of retail payments domestically, 
But we're, what we're looking out for is the extension of their domestic payment networks to take into account cross-border transactions. We've already seen uh, Singapore and Thailand experiment with this. Uh, Union Pay, as we all know, has expanded out of China into the rest of the world. And PCI, more popularly known as Rupay, has taken a slightly different approach where they are the predominant uh, system for domestic payments in India, but outside India, their cards run on the Diners Club network. The Bank of International Settlement just announced two days ago that they will be launching Project Nexus. This is a multilateral initiative. Basically, what they're trying to do is to tr um, build a switch for all the real-time payment systems of all the national switches. So the BIS will interconnect all of these switches and then you'll be able to send theoretically from Banknet to a JCB card to a Rupay card or from PayNow to, to PayNet. This one is going to be quite interesting in terms of the dynamics to the industry because it has very strong repercussions from a business model perspective for the popular international card brands like Union Pay, Visa, MasterCard. Today, these card brands have slowly seen their domestic transactions erode in terms of market share with the dominance and rise of these domestic switches. But with their foray into interconnection internationally, their relevance, even for international travel, will continue, may continue to get diminished. So we're watching this trend very closely. Another one is QR codes. I'm sure you've seen this at the stores. What we're seeing now is an initiative uh, from all the central banks within the region to build their own QR codes. So locally here, we have the PHQR. We, there's a QRIS in Indonesia. There's a SGQR in Singapore. What we're beginning to see now are, are these national QR codes linking together as well for cross-border interoperability. So the Bank of Thailand and uh, the State Bank of Vietnam have already started. Uh, the Central Bank of Indonesia is in current talks right now with the Central Bank of the Philippines for much the same activity. So this is another trend that we're watching very closely in terms of its impact to our business. Another trend we're watching is cryptocurrency. Now, to be quite candid with you, I'm not a big fan. Um, cryptocurrencies are volatile and they have no inherent value. And frankly, I find they have a high risk of obsolescence because quantum computing is on the, on the rise and the attribute of immutability is built on uh, classical computing cryptography. This trend is actually quite interesting, the central bank digital currency. You may have heard of the digital yuan in China. They're probably the world leaders in this right now. There's also some trialing with fiat digital currencies from Thailand, from Canada, Singapore. Our own Central Bank of the Philippines just completed their first study on CBDCs as well. Uh, this one we're watching, but we're not quite sure what it's going to do. Uh, in terms of the application, mostly because 92% of the money worldwide today is already digital. So the benefit of a CBDC is questionable at this point in time, although it may make it easier for the central banks to monitor their money supply. The fourth trend is actually, the sixth trend is actually quite interesting for us. It's actually already in the country because the Central Bank of the Philippines already issued a circular on open finance framework. So the open API, or sometimes called open banking, is a practice where third-party financial service providers open access to consumer banking transaction, customer data, financial data, to other banks and other non-bank financial institutions through the use of APIs or application programming interfaces. One of the pioneers here is BBVA in Spain. They've launched a commercial model actually for sharing its bank customer data. In Asia, 
many of the central banks are also looking at this very closely. I believe in the, in the Philippines, it's circular 1122 for those that are interested in terms of the BSP issued circular on this matter. Uh, the BSP has also asked industry for volunteers to participate in a pilot. So I think here the fundamental issue will be for on the user side will be who owns the data. And this is something that industry and the regulators are grappling with uh, in terms of do you, with our Data Privacy Act, do you then require explicit opt-in from the customer to share their data? Or should we let the customer be the one to drive the bank to say, I want to share my data before, before allowing the sharing? So there's a lot of issues here. Unfortunately, in the Philippines, most people don't value their data privacy very much. We have very strong laws, but the enforcement leaves something to be desired. In terms of our forecast, we're looking at three things in terms of changes to the industry. One is diminishing fee-based income opportunities for the fintechs, a shift towards embedded finance, and quantum computing going mainstream. And we'll delve into each one of these three forecasts a little bit. So in terms of diminishing fees, why we believe this, why we have this as a forecast, there's two things. One is competitive pressures coming from the big techs. So you have the Apples, the Microsoft, Facebook, WhatsApps, Facebook Messenger, WeChat, Alipay, a lot of these big techs don't depend on the fees from payments for their income. It's actually ancillary revenue for them. A lot of these techs are more dependent on ads in terms of revenue or even games for their revenue. So as they enter the market, we, we're expecting the competitive pressure will drive the payment fees towards zero and maybe even negative where they have to incentivize the users to use their payment system. This may be two, three years out still, but it's definitely coming. We've already seen uh, Facebook Messenger as a payment system in the US. WhatsApp is piloting in India. So it's just a matter of time before it comes to the Philippines. Another reason for the diminishing fees is regulation. The central banks are all advocating for financial inclusion here locally, we're about to launch the PHQR. I think the, in terms of being able to pay, uh, pay at the store at the, to the merchant, the central bank is now pressuring, cajoling and otherwise persuading industry to do the transactions for free for micropayments. Now then the next question, I, obvious question is what's a micropayment? The central bank wanted to set the threshold at 1,000 pesos. The industry is uh, looking at 400 pesos. So I would expect the, it to be somewhere in that range where you will be able to use PHQR to pay at the stores for free, free to the user and free to the merchant. We've also seen a lot of regula regulatory pressure to cap and eliminate fees. Uh, in terms of credit cards here in the Philippines, I'm not sure if you're aware, but the central bank has issued a circular capping the fees at 2% a month, where it used to be three to three and a half percent a month. Our second forecast is embedded finance. Now this, don't be intimidated by this seemingly busy slide, but basically in terms of embedded finance, there's different approaches. As you can see on the far left column, there's what I call the ecosystem builders, the pipe builders and the infrastructure embedders. So these ones have different companies. I've given you some examples there on how they approach it. I guess probably the most popular one that's known here is Grab in terms of a ride sharing platform that's also providing loans to its riders and passengers and actually got a digital bank license in Singapore recently. And they're also uh, got an electronic money issuer license in the Philippines. So all of the, that's probably more popularly known as the super app in terms of the ecosystem builders. But there's also other ways to look at the embedded finance from the industry, whether you provide connectivity as a service 
between the different industry players, or you provide infrastructure as a service for non-industry players to participate in the industry. This is a quote from Angela Strange. She's a partner with Anderson Horowitz. Those of you who are familiar with Silicon Valley will recognize the company name for sure. But this is what she said on the topic. What that means is there are several different infrastructure companies that will partner with banks and package up the licensing process and some regulatory work and all the different payment type networks that you need. So if you want to start up a financial company, instead of spending two years and millions of dollars in forming tons of partnerships, you can get all of that as a service and get going. Our third forecast is quantum computing. There's unprecedented capability for optimization by calculating probability scenarios. In the finance industry today, it's limited in terms of its, its use to um, mostly hedge funds in New York in terms of pricing of their options and their, on their margins. But as quantum goes mainstream, and we've seen that offered on the cloud as a service by uh, IBM, We've also seen on-prem installations that are available from different quantum computing providers. So it's just a matter of time before quantum computer will, make, will start making its impact felt in the financial industry. The other impact of quantum computing may be the encryption breaking capability, which will upend all of our cybersecurity protocols today that underpins the entire fintech and banking industry from a cyber security posture. What this means to say is if you use a brute force attack to crack a key, an encryption key, using classical computing, it may take you up to 20 years. With quantum computing, it could be as little as 20 minutes. At this point in time, nobody really knows, but that possibility is there, so it's a very real risk. That's also one of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of um, cryptocurrencies, because then your attribute of immutability will no longer be immutable. So what are the fintech adaptations we can look at? Now, we, in terms of the application to yourselves, I thought maybe the best way to talk about it is to share what we do internally as a fintech and how we cope with this rapidly changing industry. So this is one of the models that we use. It's called VUCA. The acronym stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. This term was actually first coined by the US military in the 60s to describe the new world and create then the need to create better ways to manage and lead. Internally, we do a lot of planning, but we don't necessarily write up the plans formally. The process itself is what we find critical. These quotes that you have on the screen from the late Prime Minister Winston Churchill and late President Dwight Eisenhower, you can see how they also thought planning was important, but the plans themselves are not important. And you know, in the Philippines, we see a lot of people like business plans, a lot of people uh, like having things on paper or in written word, but uh, the plants go, go obsolete very, very quickly in our industry. We've had plans in the past where, that we've written up and lasted 10 minutes before we had to change. That's why we gave up writing on the plans, but we do go through the planning process constantly. So in terms of the planning process, by definition, it is a prospective activity. So you have to consider things in terms of your mission, your vision, your values, of course, as an organization. Then what we would normally suggest is do an environment scan, your search for your signals. Then we'll do a baseline forecast and we'll do our alternative forecast as well. So this is our scan in terms of OmniPay, how we look at the market, how we look at the industry. For the MBAs and business grads among us, you may recognize this as Porter's competitive five forces model. 
in terms of the competitive strategy. So I'm, I'm just showing you this in terms of how we see the market today. The other thing we do is then we'll look for signals in terms of technology, societal impact and regulatory. So some of the things we talked about already that we're watching very closely right now, quantum computing, CBDCs, digital only bank licenses being issued in the Philippines, open banking platform in the circular, the impact of the pandemic, maybe the societal change of onshoring versus offshoring and the impact to uh, OFWs and of course the remittances that go with it. And in some countries, the concept of universal basic income. Then we try to, based on all that information that we gathered, then we will analyze it and come up with our own baseline forecast of what we want to do. So we wanted to broaden our definition of financial inclusion beyond payments to microfinance, microinvestments, and we wanted to extend our geographic reach beyond the Philippines. We also took a look at an alternative forecast um, where different societal models, unlike the one that we live in today, may have impacted the fintech and banking industry as well. Now, these are maybe low probability type of scenarios, but it, it's important to take a look at it so that you're prepared in case you have those black swan moments in the industry. The second step we do is we execute. Operational excellence is a baseline that that's, that's a non-negotiable and that should be across anything that you do. But the attitude we take is to fail fast and learn faster. In a dynamic industry where you're charting new territories, you can't be afraid to fail, but you have to know how to fail quickly and learn even faster. But this attitude and this approach and mindset is difficult to introduce to your management team sometimes and even harder to your staff. So it's something that you that needs to be consciously done. This is an example of one of our more spectacular failures. I thought the group may benefit from a failure rather than a success story. Uh, we tried to build a micropayment system for Sari Sari stores and we took into account the needs of the proprietor or the nanis. We were looking at de deploying a mobile device for reading cards. We knew they had cell phones because they sell mobile loads. We even talked to the fast moving consumer goods suppliers from Unilever, Tao, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola. We looked at the ones that were financing them and looked at the collection as, as well and payments to them and looked at maybe enabling them to be a remittance payout to drive more business to the sorry, sorry stores. And we actually changed our business model for it. So instead of a transaction fee that we're all used to today in, uh, in retail payments, what we did here was a subscription model. I think we charged $1 per month per sorry, sorry store, and they can charge all you want, basically an unlimited payment for that fee, right? Well, this was this this endeavor failed spectacularly. We could tell you that the average ticket size was twenty five pesos seventy centavos, roughly sixty cents U.S. And we thought that we built the system that was almost frictionless for the Sari Sari store, except for the one dollar a month, and we would provide them the device. They already had the hand phone. We talked to the industry that they operated in. We thought we had everything taken into account. Well, why did we fail? We failed because we missed one thing that was very important to them, tax. We failed to take into account that the non-ice and most of the Sari Sari store operators don't report to the BIR. They were very deathly scared of anything electronic that would leave a record. Now that may have changed now with, uh, with the COVID and lockdown where they had no choice but to go electronic. And I do have friends that are working with some Sari Sari stores now on very much the same model. 
but at the time we tried to deploy it, this is what we missed and it caused it to fail despite our best efforts. So step three is repeat. So this is a kind of a virtuous cycle that we use internally. And the faster you can do it, then the faster you learn from your mistakes, the faster you learn from your failures. Some of the potential applications that you may want to consider uh, for, for yourselves as a, in terms of your thinking about FinTech and its impact to yourself. From a business standpoint, you can look at heightened engagement with the customers, perhaps enabling automated recurring payments, real-time dashboards for periodic reporting instead of, uh, let's say, Attorney Chan waiting for month end to get a report on the financial status of the school, he can just look at the dashboard and see it real time. Data analytics for better decisions, you know, cash light disbursements for scholarships and the like, ability to monitor and regulate usage, because you can now control where the money can be spent rather than giving them cash with no control. I thought it important as well before ending the presentation to talk about some of the risks. This risk is taken from the perspective of the industry itself. So what you see here is a baby turkey on day one. And at day 1000, life's pretty good. He has his human handler feeding him, walk, giving him water, and things are going well. There's nothing for him to think that the next day will be any different. But if the next day is Thanksgiving Day, guess what happened? Now, when we look at risk, we typically are looking at it from day one to day 1000. We don't consider day 1001 type of perspective. From a fintech industry, that's what we're always fighting against, what we're always struggling with. And that's why we take a lot of time and effort in terms of scanning the industry, looking out for new things, what developments may or innovations in other industries may impact our own. I like this quote from the late uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld from the US, because I think it sums up one of the most profound statements on risk that I've seen. There are known knowns. These are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things we know we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we don't know we don't know. And that third part, that's what keeps me up and uh, scanning the environment at all times. So some of the risks in terms of dealing with fintechs that you should consider, whether you're using them as a, or engaging them from a corporate or personal standpoint, what's their exposure risk? On the left side are the financial risk and on the right are the non-financial risk. Now from a bank standpoint, that reputational risk is very high. Compliance risk is very high. IT risk in terms of the longevity of the and uh, of the company is very high. And the financial risk, I think the settlement risk is high for most users. I don't know how many of us will use PayPal, but PayPal is not regulated regulated here in the Philippines. I'm not saying PayPal is a bad company and not to use them. I'm just saying you should be aware of the risk. If they don't, if you don't get your money from them, you have no recourse locally. Whereas if you use a local product, whether it be RCBC or Gcash, if you cannot come to terms with your bank or financial institution, you always have the central bank as a final recourse for appeal. We talked a little bit about these black swan events earlier in terms of the Turkey's day 1001. I want to leave you with this thought. Prior to last year, how many of us would have thought about COVID-19, the pandemic, and the world coming to a standstill? Or even the financial markets, oil fell to negative prices because of that. Imagine what it would be like from the 
oil company's perspective, their shipping company's perspective, what's the impact on it? Who would have thought that oil would be negative value? These events to us in hindsight are obvious, but prior to it actually occurring, nobody would have considered. And th these for me are the big risk events. And that's why the environmental scanning is very, very important, looking out for those signals on what could impact your, your own business and your, your own uh, enterprise. Some of the takeaways that I wanted to leave with you in terms of fintechs. When you're looking at a fintech, normally what I'll do is make consideration for these questions. One, does it make a process faster, cheaper, safer, or more convenient? If you can't get a quick answer to that, then I have to ask you, why are you using it? Second one is, is the fintech a regulated entity by the central bank so you can mitigate your risk? You can, of course, depend on other things like who owns it. If it's, is it a subsidiary of a bank, but not regulated by the central bank, maybe it's okay, right? Is it a startup? Are they regulated? Where is your data kept? Is it properly secured? Do they have the systems and processes in place? So those are the considerations that I'd like to leave with you in terms of your own dealings with FinTech. Thank you for listening so intently. This is the end of my presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Simon Ong. Now we are opening the floor for questions. Kindly please send your questions through the chat box and we'll be happy to accommodate your questions. All right, so can, can I stop your sharing, Sir Simon? Sure. All right, so that we can focus now with the um, Q&A, the open forum. Okay, so we have one question here, Sir Simon. Uh, will the use of digital banking also lead to the use of artificial intelligence? Therefore, future supermarket in the Philippines will be unmade of staffs. All transactions will be done in digital payment and purchases will be directly debited to one's bank account. This will mean phasing out of sales personnel, cashier, security, and et cetera. Yeah, I think you've seen that ex uh, being experimented with in the US. I think uh, Whole Foods has some experiments like that where there's unmanned groceries. In the Philippines, I think we're still a long ways away uh, because we're highly unbanked. Less than half of our population, probably closer to 60, 65% don't have bank accounts. Uh, in terms of transaction accounts, I think the central bank's target is to reach 50% penetration by 2025. So until that time, you're going to have a lot of uh, cash still with us. I think the also the other danger of going completely cashless is the inequity in terms of the socioeconomic demographics. And the ones that are most dependent on cash tend to be at the lower uh, economic strata of our society. And so we have to be very careful in terms of going too aggressive into e-payments only, because that would mean you're going to end up discriminating against the poor, who typically are the ones that won't have access to the cash. So you have to consider the societal impact as well. Uh, in terms of artificial intelligence, you've all seen it already. If you're on Facebook, if you use Google at, in any ways, you'll see, you check something out on, on one site and you'll start seeing the ads pop up in your social media feeds, right? So the, the AI is definitely there. The Whether the supermarkets will use it to start predicting what you buy, uh, whether you start 
investing in smart refrigerators that know what the contents of your ref would be and, and when to order for you. You know, it, it depends. I, I think in the US and Canada, in the Western cultures, it's probably more prevalent because their household sizes tend to be smaller, right? It tends to be the nuclear family. Here in the Philippines, we tend to have extended families, right? You have intergenerational families staying in one household. You have house help as well. So I think it will be a lot more challenging to do something like that in the Philippines than it would be in the U.S. Right. Okay, an additional answer from Sir Carlos Tenkiat. For intangible organizations must also take into account how to deal with the reputational risks, especially in customer care and consumer protection. What are good best practices that you would recommend? Yeah, the, the, those types of considerations is key. And that's why I asked um, in my presentation towards the end, you saw the suggestion to take a look behind the FinTech to make sure they're regulated. If they're regulated by the central bank, you can always appeal to the central bank. The central bank itself actually has a consumer hotline that you can call as a customer to appeal. And I can tell you from experience that when you call that, the central bank actually takes action. They will notify the institution in question. They will give them a deadline to respond and show proof, right? So right. the central bank does try to resolve it. It's not just sitting there doing nothing, right? So in terms of consumer protection, that's probably the best way to make sure your funds are safe is to check if they're regulated by the central bank. Um, thanks, Carlos, for that question. Uh, just for disclosure purposes, Carlos was my co-founder in both Bastion and OmniPay. All right. Another one from Sir Samuel Tan. Thanks for the very informative presentation. In the U.S., ransomware attacks are being becoming larger and more common. Will the Philippines become more vulnerable as we move to a more digital payment society? If so, are there any mitigating measures that the government can do in the present to protect the companies and citizens from future attacks? In, I think the risk of being scammed exists whether it's in the physical world or virtual world. As we move towards digital, of course, the scams will also move towards digital. Uh, you know, the ransomware, everybody knows how to protect against ransomware. You know, do your regular backups, right? Don't click on uh, unknown links, and yet it still works. You know, frankly, it always comes down to the human user. I don't think the government is really in a position to do anything about it. Uh, what they can do is maybe catch the perpetrators or try to catch the perpetrators. I think you've seen that in the colonial pipeline ransomware situation where the FBI actually recovered some of the Bitcoin that was paid as ransom. Um, but it's very, very difficult, number one. Two, I don't think the Philippine government has that capability today. Uh, but three, it's really incumbent upon the consumer himself to be responsible. You know, it gives me nightmares to see people using those cute little avatars on Facebooks, for example. You know, when, when you see that and it's free, the question you should be asking yourself is why are they doing that? Most of them, some may be legitimate and innocent or innocuous, but a lot of them are actually harvesting your personal data so they can have an easier time to hack you, right? And yet most people won't think twice about clicking through it just because it looks cute or somebody else is, is using it, right? So you have to, that cyber hygiene is a personal responsibility. There's no way you can rely on the government to be able to do that for you. All right. Thank you. Another question from Ms. Lisa Morco. Do you think Gcash 917 Venture IPO will materialize this year? I'm sorry, okay. I am not in a position to be able to comment on that. I think I'll get in trouble with the PSC on that if I were mm. to say anything. And All my right. friends at Gcash won't be happy. All right. 
So another question we have here, it was humored that a known bank in the Philippines experienced huge amount and authorized withdrawals. Why such things occurred? If, um, if it's being referred to the skimming experiences before, this was, I think, circa 2017, 2018. Basically, what happened there were the ATM cards were skimmed. Mm -hmm. uh, that, now, that should not occur as much now, because now if you notice your cards have chips on them, that was actually the main reason for the, for the central bank pushing to the chip. What the skimming skimmers used to do is they walk by you. They can actually pick up your MagStripe data Right, or if you don't have sight of your card all the time, you give it to the waiter, right, and they can swipe it through their card reader, and then basically copy your MagStripe data, okay. And then what they would also do then on some of the ATMs, they would put an overlay on top of the pin pad, right. So when you enter the pin, you're actually entering it onto another device as well that's recording it, unlike if you were just using a legitimate ATM. Some also use the pinhole cameras on the ATMs that they would use, right? So there, there's a lot of ways that they were doing, uh, using to techniques that they were using to be able to skim your card data. And that's why I think it was mid 2018, the central bank had a hard deadline for all the financial institutions to are, are mandated to use chip, EMV chip on your, on your cards. So you should not have any more cards left that without the chip. But that's right. actually to address that. All right. So the next one is from Sir Brianna, from Dr. Brianna. Someone advised me not to trust certain apps in my CP as I use mobile banking. Does that advice have basis? Is one's mobile banking at risk because of other apps? Yes, it's definitely possible. Uh, if we had no ethics, and Carlos is actually the expert on this, uh, it, you know, in terms of uh, cybersecurity. The, you can run an app on your phone that would then, of course, harvest your own data, right? Unknowingly to you. There are, there are malware out there that actually will overhear or use your camera, right? Even listen in on your conversations, track your movements. It's all there. Right, the, the technology is there now. How it's used, you know, depends on what apps you enable on your phone, right? So, for in our case, for example, I'll use a different phone when I go to China, right? Because the Chinese government tends to be very intrusive. For example, if I'm not sure about apps, I will use one phone for my work and for banking and a different phone for maybe the social media ones, right? So it, 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 there are there is definitely that risk. My suggestion is to be very prudent in terms of what apps you install in your phone, which ones are known to you in terms of legitimacy, right? I, I would be very careful just because they're on the app store doesn't make it safe, right? You know that Google is always going through and, and, and pulling down apps that they find have malware, right? So obviously this is something that you, you really want to keep a close eye on. All right. Thank you. Another one is, um, what are your thoughts about the Axie Infinity? The Axie Infinity, it, was, it became popular like last two months until this month. The game that, it's a game application that uses cryptocurrency where people can earn money by just playing the game. Well, you know, I, if you are able to play it without putting money in, then and you can isolate it in a specific device, then maybe it's okay, right? Just be wary of what you use in terms of what data you share with it. Are you required to give some sort of personal data? Are you required to um, 
turn on certain features or give permissions to the app that really shouldn't be there, right? Uh, where is the cryptocurrency coming from? Are you able to cash out? Now, if you have no risk and you enjoy playing the game, then by all means, right? But uh, I would be very wary, you know, from a from the game developer standpoint, how do they make money, right? That would be my question. What are they getting out of developing this game, letting you play for free, right? So if, if anytime I see something like this, I am very cautious because it doesn't make sense, right? And if it doesn't make sense, then there's something else going on that we need to be careful about. Right. All right, thank you, sir. Another one is from, um, from the chat box. Will cashless society possible in the Philippines? If yes, when do you think will it happen? Uh, I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime, to, to be quite frank. It's difficult in the Philippines because we're an archipelago, right? And our connectivity leaves much to be desired still. And if you and our national ID hasn't really been deployed properly yet. And so these are kind of fundamentals that you require. So until we can fix the connectivity and have it nationwide, truly nationwide, right? Until you have a functional national ID that can be digital instead of just a piece of plastic, right? It's going to be very difficult to get there, right? Most of our population can't even get a government ID yet. Right, so to go cashless is kind of the next step in the progression, right? So right. You, it, until you can get there, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, personally, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see it happen, but I don't think it will happen in my lifetime. Okay, next, um, remittance from OFWs is huge. Which crypto projects should OFWs use or just stick to BTC or ETH? Well, I'm probably the wrong person to ask about that because I actually don't like uh, using cryptocurrencies. Uh, one is it's very volatile, right? And contrary to what people think, and it's not even the green concerns about the, gen the mining that goes into the crypto, but if you consider the volatility in terms of the value, there's also friction points going, taking fiat currency, let's say they're in Canada. So you take Canadian dollars, you have to buy Bitcoin. So you have friction, friction costs there. Then you send the, you can send the Bitcoin quickly to the Philippines, right? But then once it gets to the Philippines then you have to pull it out as pesos, right? So that you have two conversions there, right? Then those are friction points as well, right? So to say that it's free isn't necessarily accurate because you have two very definite times of our two stages of that transaction that attract friction, right? And in between, then this changes, it could go up or down, right? And so it, unless you had no other choice, personally, I would send it you know, a different way. Right, okay. So uh, we have one last question. So please, if you still have questions, just put it in the chat box or admit your mic. Uh, we have one last question here in the chat box as of the moment. Um, is it possible or is it feasible to set up a cashless transaction in our school campus? If yes, what would be your tips in setting it up easier? It's actually very feasible the, because the campus is a controlled environment. Uh, what I would do personally is I would, um, if you have a school ID, I would make it part of the school ID. Right. And uh, Chiang Kai-shek already has people from its alumni that are well-versed. So you can ask Samuel Tan, you can ask Carlos Tenkiat. I'm happy to help if you want, but uh, you have in organic talent, if you will, that can execute that in terms of a cashless campus. I think uh, in UBC, they went cashless campus around 94. So everything from the dorms to the library, parking meters to the cafeteria, tuition, everything was all of it cashless. cashless. All right. Yeah. So the students walk around campus, there's no cash. Mm -hmm. So you either tap or you pay with your phone. 
I think locally, I haven't really seen a cashless campus. Probably the closest would be ISM, mm -hmm. where they it's they have a card as well, using your student ID card to for purchases, whether at the bookstore or at the at the cafeteria and the like. Okay. But definitely feasible. That's actually quite easy yeah. to do. All right. Is there anything else, um, attendees? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Mary. Opo, opo. Yes. Uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for that very informative talk. Very, that's an excellent one. My concern is, uh, I am a depositor of uh, Metro Bank. Okay, and they were able to tell me, you open a uh, a debit card. It's an ATM card which I found to be very helpful. On the other hand, <clears throat> the very same branch manager was telling me, uh, wag ka lang makadami ng lagay, halimbawa, hanggang 20 lang, because it might jeopardize your, your, your account, telling me na baka mahak. So I felt confused. You are, in, you are telling us to make use, and they have letters. Thank you very much for using your debit card. However, may however ganon, pero hindi written. So how do I reconcile? Well, uh, Dr. Neri, I, this is, I think the short answer to that is you have to be careful with your card, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, if you are using your debit card at a Metro Bank ATM, I think that's a very safe transaction. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were using it at the point of sale terminal, for example, mm -hmm. at the merchant that maybe you're not familiar with, then that would be higher risk. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, personally, I will never use a debit card at a point of sale device. And I will never use a debit card for e-commerce transactions. I will only use it for ATM withdrawals. And the reason is this, if you have a credit card and you get scammed, yeah. You can charge back the transaction. As a cardholder, you have that right. You have six months when, from the time of transaction to contest the charge, right? So let's say you have a credit card, a, a Metro Bank uh, Visa card, for example, and you use it at the point of sale, and then you get hacked. And then that suddenly you have transactions appearing from uh, Nigeria, right? <laughs> you can call up my Metro Bank and say, these are not my transactions. I want to charge it back. And Metro Bank will actually challenge for you through Visa to the Nigerian merchant and the Nigerian bank so that you are kept whole and you don't lose money. Okay. Now these are called charge back rights, but it's only available to credit cards. It is not available to debit cards. So I would never use a debit card for shopping. Personally, I mean, that, that's because you have uh, more rights with credit. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah. So I think we have exhausted all of the questions in the chat box and from our audience. All right. So, yeah, calling one, calling twice. <laughs> okay, so I think we're done. Now, um, let us proceed to the awarding of certificate. Share my screen. All right, the text of the certificate reads, Chiang Kai-shek College awards this certificate of appreciation to Mr. Simon Ong for sharing his knowledge, wisdom, and talents as resource speaker during the webinar entitled Digital Banking Awareness, a Threat to Traditional Banking Practices, organized by the Office for Continuing Professional Education given this 31st day of July, 2021 at Chiang Kai-shek College, Manila, Philippines, signed by Attorney Danny Chan, President. Once again, thank you very much, um, Sir Simon. And yeah, at this point, we would also like to invite um, the, the attendees to turn on your camera so that we can take a snapshot, just a souvenir for us to, uh, so that Sir has a souvenir with us. <laughs> Okay, let's turn on our cameras and show our best smiles on screen. 
All right. Still waiting for some more. Okay, fix your hair. All right, we have here our president, Attorney Chan. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Okay. Also have Dr. Rollins. Hi, Sir Rollins. Good afternoon. Hello, Sir. Good afternoon. Po. All right. So all smiles on screen. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay. We have two pages. Let me just get the other page done. All right. One more. Last one. Last one, please. Okay. Smile and... Okay, we're done with the photo. Thank you very much. Now we would also like to invite everyone to answer the evaluation form so that you can receive your certificate of attendance. I sent the link in the chat box already. Okay, so while you are answering the webinar evaluation, I guess it's a wrap for everyone. I guess the best way to wrap this up is to use the taglines of the bank and the software where our speaker is affiliated, right? <laughs> From Maybank mm -hmm. and Omnipay. Okay. Making every moment count and banking beyond borders. Okay. So for us to make every moment count, we should learn how to do banking beyond borders. Thank you very much for spending your afternoon with us and to the CKS College administrators for consistently providing webinars for us. Once again, this has been Aldrin Antonio from the Office for Continuing Professional Education. Thank you for coming to today's webinar. Stay safe and sane. Have a great day and see you on the next webinar. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Family. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye, thank sir. You, thank, you. Bye -bye. Thank, you. thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Sir Simon, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sir, sir Simon. Simon. Thank you very much. God bless. Stay safe. Thank you.